You all know the story. We stopped it, and USGS will stay here. I want to say that our way of life is really under siege now. It's, it's under threat. Um, my Democratic opponent, if elected to Congress, would be caucusing with the liberal majority today, the liberal majority that brought you government-run health care, a stimulus didn't that didn't create any private sector jobs. It created jobs maybe in China. Um, quadrupled our deficit in just four years when Nancy Pelosi took over in 2006. And so the, it's real clear which way do we want to go. I have been so honored and privileged to serve all of you over the last several years in Congress. I love my home. I love our congressional district, and I'd be honored to serve once again. Thank you, Ms. Emerson. Mr. Bill. Uh, I'd like to thank the university and ASIM for allowing us to hold this forum. I'd also like to thank the people that are attending and watching this and listening uh, for being actively involved in the politics of the United States. And I think that's critical for right now. My name is uh, Larry Bill. I'm from uh, Jackson, Missouri in Cape Girardeau County. And whenever I uh, watched our Congress, both actually both parties in action, and particularly during the, the uh, TARP uh, bailout, I thought, you know, those people up there, I don't think they have the practical real life experience that we do back here in Missouri, back in the 8th District. Now, I grew up on a farm in uh, Cape Girardeau County, uh, went to SEMO, worked my way through college, got, to, uh, got a degree. Uh, after that, I served uh, 13 years active duty in the Air Force as a pilot. And after that, I served nine years reserve duty at a major headquarters and actually ended up retiring as a lieutenant colonel. In the meantime, for the last 17 years, my wife and I have been working uh, in the local economy down in uh, Cape Girardeau County where we buy houses, uh, remodel them, and then resell them or rent them back out again. And even though I've got degrees, I'm, my primary job is to be the chief carpenter, electrician, and plumber. And then my wife does the house cleaning, and she also does all the painting. And we've been doing this in the local economy for 17 years and actually helping produce jobs with our own activity. And that one thing about business experience, I think, is probably one of my strengths uh, whenever it comes to, to uh, approaching this job. Now, I took a look at uh, what does it take to get into Congress, and the conventional route is to align with a major party, uh, generate money from lobbyists, big donors, out-of-state donors, and then buy all the advertising you can to influence the people back home. And I call that putting ingredients in the cake. And when you put the same ingredients in the cake, you still get the same cake going back to Washington. So let's, I thought, let's take a little different approach to politics this time. Let's do something different. So I found out I could become an independent candidate, and that's one of the hardest ways to get on the ballot. To get on the ballot, we had to get 5,600 signatures of registered voters uh, on our petition, turn them in, have them verified, and when we finally finished doing that, after going door to door for about a year, uh, we were certified with around 6,700 valid signatures. And that allowed us to get back on the ballot. And that way, whenever I go to Washington, I won't have to answer to the party bosses. I'm going to look for a conservative leadership once I get back to uh, Washington, D.C. The other side of the coin is campaign finances. In our campaign, we have made the conscious decision to accept no financial contributions from any source except myself and my wife. And what we tried to do is be creative and use uh, different methods. This is really going to be a good method for me right here at this debate to get our message out. And what we did is we went door to door and we would ask people, we would say, hey, I'm Larry Bill. I'm running for Congress as an independent, and the only way I can get on the ballot is if you, registered voter, would sign my petition. And sometimes these people were a little skeptical, and so I'd go, well, they'd say, well, what, are you, what are you interested in? I said, well, here's what I think we need. I think we need term limits for congressmen. I think we need to reduce spending. I think we need to stop illegal immigration. 
and I think we need energy independence. And these people would look at me, and, and they were, they would, they would have, sometimes they'd have a scowl on their face. And they'd just keep listening to me, and I kept telling them, this is what I'm interested in, but when I got to the end of my uh, pitch, essentially, as a salesman, they would say, well, it's about time somebody stepped up and took action. So, Do you know we're $13 trillion in debt? Do you know we could have stopped part of the Gulf crisis if we didn't have the Jones Act? And I was just totally inspired by the amount of the electorate that I've met who recognized the problems in, the question, in, in, this, in this country the way I did too. And so after doing that, often they would sign. And I appreciated it because I don't think they so much like me as the fact that in Missouri, people think that you deserve a fair shake. And that's how we successfully got on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you all for the opening remarks. The questions for this afternoon's debate fall into largely three general categories. The federal government's role in education, national defense, and the federal government's involvement in the economy. The first question goes to Mr. Sowers, and it's a two-part question. A recent law signed by President Obama changes the originator of federally funded and backed college loans. Instead of private banks issuing loans backed by the federal government, all federal loans will originate directly from the government. How do you feel about these recent changes in the student loan system? And secondly, do you support federal involvement in higher education? Well, the, the federal government has expanded their scope in a number of ways that I think are unfavorable. Uh, most notably is the Wall Street bailout and uh, the government now owning insurance companies and uh, owning large portions of large banks. I don't agree with that sort of insertion into the private marketplace. I, I have spoken a lot with a number of students that now have a crushing debt when they leave uh, their undergraduate uh, careers. The average student now leaves undergraduate with approximately $50,000, and that limits the amount of options that they have. So when you look at the federal government getting involved with the uh, federal student loans, it's something that I don't think that you should have, it, it should be pure for profit, and I, there is some role for the federal government in that. Um, but then when we look at federal government involved with education, I've spent a lot of time speaking with teachers, and I'm a teacher myself. I taught here at s and and at uh, West Point before that. And the main expansion of the federal government has been uh, with no child left behind. And the teachers in rural districts almost uniformly do not agree with it. It applies a single federal standard down uh, to districts like ours that do not take into account the increased number of special needs children, the distance of busing, and the unique characteristics of, for example, what we have down at RTI or in the Votech School. Congresswoman Emerson voted for No Child Left Behind and then failed to fund it. So I want to go and make sure that the federal government is not just applying a one-size-fits-all program to education. Mr. Van Dieven. Well, I believe that the uh, school funding mandates that were made possible through the health care bill, if I'm correct. Um, I don't believe that this is going to help keep prices down in higher education. I'm afraid that this is just going to end up being another taxpayer liability. Um, I foresee an increase in student defaults and the taxpayer is going to be holding the bag on these because there's no incentive for the universities to keep prices down. They are guaranteed payment from the federal government. I actually prefer a dollar for dollar tax break to individuals that will donate to scholarships, private or public. And I believe that more people will look at this, especially wealthy individuals, they will see this as an opportunity to donate their money to their alma mater or to a cause that they are in favor of as opposed to giving taxes directly to the federal government. Thank you. Ms. Emerson. Thank you. Um, number one, I think we're talking about higher education. So number one, um, I, am, I am opposed to the federal government having total control over direct student loans. 
Uh, my, my daughters actually uh, used private uh, funding from private sector uh, banks for assistance in, in their student loans. I think it's important to have as many avenues available uh, so that our young people have options. And, and therefore, uh, I truly am against the federal government being the only originator of direct student loans. With regard to federal involvement in higher education, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the research that's being done here at uh, MS&T is extraordinary, whether it's energy research, whether it's military uh, technology, whether it's the work that um, is done for Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, some of that is, is federally uh, sponsored, and I think it's a very important investment because then what's happened in many cases is that the patents that are derived from a lot of the research are then taken to the private sector, and then suddenly you grow jobs in a community. So I'm, I very much support that, and I think that it's very important. Let me um, make a response back to, to Mr. Sowers on something uh, with regard to the eighth poorest district. Number one, um, this is not the eighth poorest district. The, um, I'm sad to say it's the 67th, according to the latest American Community Service, but it's not poor as far as our lifestyles go. Those com make comparisons in median income, so the figures that, that Tommy gives um, compare us to Manhattan. Well, listen, it's a whole lot less expensive to live here. We have a much better quality of life. Uh, we, we have many more opportunities. Uh, for a good lifestyle because it doesn't cost as much. And the, we also have 25% of all retirees Time. Uh, in our district. Mr. Bill. Uh, you know, this, where the federal government took over the federal loans was just one more thing to rationalize the, the Obama health care plan. I uh, really, I've got to got mixed feelings about it because when the original program was out, essentially what the federal government was doing by backstopping or backing up uh, private bank loans, if there was default, they, they, they were still made 100% whole. So it was either, it's, it's either if we win, I get it, if we lose, you get it type attitude and type approach. Now, I don't know if the default rates are gonna go up Probably they won't because we'll have some capability possibly through the uh, income tax returns to get to get some payment back as opposed to injecting one more party in here and the, and the government may in fact uh, come out ahead on this as opposed to, to not being ahead. So I right now, like I said, I have mixed feelings about it. I would rather the, the federal government was not involved at all, but if they're going to back the loans and, and take the heat, uh, this is one opportunity for the taxpayer possibly to benefit as well. As far as federal involvement in education, I would like to reduce the uh, federal involvement in education. I think uh, we should reduce or eliminate the Department of Education because the tax dollars that we end up sending there get uh, siphoned off with bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., and then they get siphoned off in Jeff City, and by the time it hits back to the school, there's not much left for education. And if we can reduce that, I think we'll be much better off. And that's why I would, ad I would advocate for elimination of Department of Education. Thank you. The first response to question number two will come from Mr. Van Dieven. <clears throat> the Senate recently voted down a bill that would have repealed the policy of don't ask, don't tell regarding gays in the military. What is your stance on this policy and would you support its repeal? Well, I believe that this is an important issue that, a size, that affects a sizable portion of the population um, yes, I would favor a repeal of don't ask, don't tell, just because I don't believe that it's really anybody's business what their sexual orientation is. And I would extend this also to gay marriage, and I can't state it any simpler that what transpires between two consenting adults is none of my business. And unfortunately, government has forced my consideration on this because they offer a different set of benefits to a different set of people based on their sexual orientation. Uh, adoption rights, um, some of the GI Bill benefits that uh, our soldiers experience and um, 